Hi everyone, welcome to Physiology for Students. Today we will talk about the types of membrane transport, the way that molecules get in and out of the cell. In this membrane transport lecture, we will talk about membrane selectivity and how it leads to the different forms of membrane transport. We will compare and contrast channels and carrier molecules, which are the types of transport proteins. We will also talk about the importance of gradients for moving molecules across the membrane in and out of the cell. And finally, we'll compare active and passive transport processes and give examples of each. In our cells lecture, we talked about the different organelles and also the structure of the plasma membrane. Let's review the structure of the plasma membrane here. So remember that the plasma membrane is a semi-permeable barrier, meaning that not everything is able to get across this membrane. It's composed primarily of phospholipids, but it also includes other important molecules, many different types of proteins, carbohydrates, which make glycoproteins and glycolipids, also cholesterol and other important lipids. Remember that the structure of the membrane, especially the phospholipids, is important for understanding why molecules can and cannot cross it. The structure of the phospholipids is such that it forms hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. The outer regions of the membrane are the hydrophilic heads, the phosphate groups of those phospholipids. The hydrophilic heads form these polar regions that repel water and charged molecules. The inner layer of the membrane is the large hydrophobic region. The hydrophobic region is formed by the inner lipid region. This area is lipid rich and allows only lipids to cross. So when we look overall at membrane structure, we see that the membrane repels charged or polar substances and allows lipid soluble or nonpolar substances to cross. So substances that cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer because of this large hydrophobic region require transport proteins. Here we have channels and carriers, and we're going to talk about the difference between channel proteins and carrier proteins. Keep in mind that these are categories, and some transport proteins are actually somewhat in between channels and carriers. So these are protein molecules that span the membrane and allow molecules that would not otherwise be able to cross get past that hydrophobic region of the membrane. So let's talk then about channels. Channels are a type of transport protein that form a pore in the membrane. This is a selective pore that creates an opening for specific, usually small, molecules to pass through. The pore is open from intracellular to extracellular regions, but it's selective based on the amino acid composition and its conformational structure, usually selective for a particular type of ion or a particular group of ions. So typically these channels are going to be carrying ions. For example, sodium, potassium, calcium channels. These type of channels move ions or small molecules very, very quickly. So one of the things that distinguishes them from carrier proteins is that they move fast. They move on the order of about 1 times 10 to the 6th molecules per second. That's very, very fast speed for channels to allow molecules to cross the membrane. And it's going to depend on the molecular gradients, whether those molecules move in or out. And we'll talk about gradients in a minute. So once they're open, the molecules will follow their diffusion gradients to cross through these passageways or pores, either in or out of the cell. Channels are regulated by gates. 
Gates can take many forms, but it's usually some portion of the protein that will close the passageway of this channel. There's different ways that gates are regulated. So it's very important to control the movement of ions in and out of the cell, both for concentration gradients, but also for electrical gradients. So most channels are closed at rest and require some kind of stimulus to open their gates. So there's ligand gated or chemically gated channels that require the binding of a molecule to open that channel. There's phosphorylation or kinase gated channels, which require some cascade of signaling event in the cell that phosphorylates the channel and then opens it. There's voltage gated or electrically gated channels that have a change that are sensitive to a change in voltage in the cell and they change conformation then to open their gates to allow the ions through. And finally, there's mechanically gated channels. These are often related to touch sensation or touch receptors, meaning that there's some kind of mechanical push that actually opens up those channels. In any case, there are open and closed states of these channels, typically ion channels. They will be closed until they have some kind of stimulus to open up, and then their specific selective ions will be able to move either in or out following their diffusion gradients. Let's contrast that with carriers. So carriers don't form a complete passageway between the intracellular and extracellular space. Typically what a carrier does is it binds a select molecule, let's say it's binding it on the extracellular space, binds the molecule, and then changes conformation to open to the other side of the membrane, the intracellular portion of the membrane, to let that molecule into the cell. So there's never a continuous passageway. It's a conformational change that binds a molecule and then releases the molecule to the other side of the membrane. As you can imagine, that binding and conformational change makes the process slower. So carrier molecules are typically slower, more on the order of 1 times 10 to the 3 molecules per second, so much, much slower than the typical channel. Of course, as I said, some transport proteins are somewhere between channels and carriers. Now that we have a visual of how molecules can get in and out of the cell, let's talk about some specific transport processes to allow those molecules to pass. So most of you have heard of a lot of these membrane transport processes in your general biology courses, but it's very important to review them, and I'm going to give you some examples of specific molecules in the body and how they would move in and out of the membrane. So first, simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is the movement of molecules through a membrane without the need for a transport or carrier proteins. So think a couple minutes ago about the types of molecules that are able to get across the membrane without the need for transport proteins. And this requires no energy. They simply follow their diffusion gradient. Okay, if you said in your head lipid-soluble molecules, you were correct. So lipid-soluble molecules are able to cross the membrane without any energy and without the need for any transport protein processes. So some examples would be urea as a lipid-soluble molecule. We could also add steroid hormones here. Uh, also gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen, can move freely across the membrane. So those follow simple diffusion principles. Here's a diagram of a lipid bilayer where you can see on the extracellular space, there's a high concentration of a particular molecule. And if we assume that this is the type of molecule that can simply cross the membrane, you'll see that over time, those molecules will even out between the extracellular and intracellular space, meaning that it's able to diffuse back and forth. And eventually, if it reaches equilibrium, it will have equal concentrations on either side 
of the membrane. So this is something that freely passes and just relies on simple diffusion. There's also diffusion through a channel. So simple diffusion through a channel is what we talked about previously, where you have, say, for example, an ion channel that doesn't require energy to open. It's gated by some other mechanism. Once that channel is open, then there's free movement of that particular molecule following its diffusion gradient. So diffusion through a channel is the movement of molecules across the membrane, but these are molecules that require a channel to get across. So here we're thinking about ions, anything that's charged like sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, they all have particular channels, many types of channels for ions, um, and also aquaporin. So there's a specific type of water channel that's actually always open when it's present, and these aquaporins allow water to move freely across the membrane as long as the aquaporins are present and open. In addition, there's diffusion through a carrier. So remember that channels and carriers are different. So we call this carrier-mediated diffusion, which, which requires a conformational change in the carrier protein. But the molecule is still going to follow its simple diffusion principles, meaning it's gonna move from high concentration to low concentration, as long as that carrier is active and able to bind to that molecule. The difference here is that using a carrier versus a channel. So because the carrier has to bind and go through a conformational change, there's actually a limit or a transport maximum that the carrier has for being able to transport these molecules across the membrane. So when we look at carrier-mediated diffusion, it's limited by carrier availability, and it has particular kinetics of that carrier because of the conformational changes that are required. So some examples of carrier-mediated diffusion are the GLUT proteins. You'll see GLUT to represent glucose transporters. There's many different types of glucose transporters in cells. These are classic facilitated diffusion examples. Facilitated diffusion meaning that the molecule requires a transport channel to get across the membrane, but it does not require energy. So I want you to write this on your slide right now. Just because there's a channel doesn't mean it requires energy. There is no ATP required for facilitated diffusion. You simply have a limit based on the number of carriers. Another example would be amino acid transporters. So there's different transporters for amino acids in the cell membrane as well, and they work similar to the glucose transporters where they again have their own kinetics and limitations based on how many transporters are available, but no energy required if they're simple facilitated diffusion transporters. So when we're thinking about diffusion, whether facilitated or simple diffusion, we want to think about some factors that can affect diffusion. These are basic physical chemical properties of diffusion. So some factors that can affect diffusion are temperature, so the warmer the temperature, the more the molecules move around, the more they can diffuse. The molecular weight of the molecule that's moving, in other words, big things move slow, so big molecules are slower to move across the membrane. Uh, the distance, how far it has to go, how far across the membrane, uh, or, or how far it has to travel. The, the surface area of the space it's diffusing across. Um, and, and this is important when we look at different cell types. So in areas of diffusion, you'll see these very, very thin, simple squamous epithelial layers that have the thinnest possible areas of diffusion. And then you know you're in an area specialized to get those molecules moving across quickly. We see that, for example, 
in the air sacs of the lungs where we're moving oxygen and carbon dioxide quickly across those air sacs in and out. And then lipid solubility. As we said, the more lipid soluble the molecule, the easier it can diffuse across the membrane. Those are very simple diffusion uh, concepts. The last piece I want to talk to you about for diffusion are the gradients. Gradients are going to come up a lot in physiology, so I want you to be familiar with the types of gradients you will see. So gradients are formed when there are unequal amounts of something across a region. So in this case, we're usually talking about across a membrane, but bear in mind, gradients are applied in many different ways in the body. So we can have concentration gradients where the amount of a molecule is different across a region. We can have electrical gradients where the net charge of many molecules is different across a region, creating positive and negative regions pressure gradients, for example, blood pressure gradients or the movement of fluid, the flow of fluid depends on blood pressure gradients, and um, other pressure gradients like the partial pressure of gases, allowing gases to move across different regions. And then finally, osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure is the specific pressure related to solute concentration and the the movement of water molecules, and we'll talk about that as well. So keep in mind there's many different gradients that can cause a change of where and how molecules move. So molecules will move passively with gradients without the need for energy or ATP input. So first, concentration gradients. Concentration gradients occur when there's a difference in the amount of a particular molecule outside versus inside the cell. We always do this in reference to the inside of the cell. So if we're looking at the net diffusion or how the diffusion is going to change, we look at the concentration outside minus the concentration inside. Yes, we could have just as easily done it the other way around, but we always do it this way for reference. So if you remember back to some of your prerequisite courses, when we look at diffusion, molecules always move from high concentration to low concentration. So let's say we have a membrane and here's the outside and here's the inside of the membrane. If we have a lot of molecule on the outside of the membrane, then there's going to be a diffusion of that molecule inside the cell or across the membrane. That's going to lead to a positive value in our net diffusion. So let's just put a number to it. Let's say, you know, we have 50 outside and 10 inside. That's going to give us a positive 40. I'm completely making up these numbers. Positive 40 value. We're going to have a net movement inward to the inside of the cell. Now let's switch it and instead, let's say that the inside of the cell has a lot more molecules versus the outside of the cell and we do that same diffusion calculation. In this case, we'll get a negative number. So let's say now we have 10 on the outside and 50 on the inside. There we're going to get 10 minus 50. We'll get a negative 40 on the inside. So when we're calculating diffusion, if we get a positive value, that means that that molecule has a net movement into the cell. If we get a negative value, that molecule has a net movement out of the cell membrane. And of course, if we get zero, let's say we're in a 50-50 situation, then we get 50 minus 50, we have no net movement, meaning the molecules will move equally to either side of the membrane and it's balanced. 
So concentration gradient is fairly simple. You just look at where the molecule is the highest and know that it's going to spread out to areas of lower concentration. Electrical gradients occur when we have a difference in charge across the membrane. And this is created by charged molecules or ions. So in this case, if we look at the outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell, let's say we have a bunch of positive charge building up on the outside of the membrane and negative charge building up on the inside of the membrane. If I put a positive ion then outside, let's put a positive sodium ion outside, for example, which direction does that ion want to move? Well, if you remember, opposite charge attracts. So if you have a bunch of positive molecules in a positive space, they're repelled. They want to move towards the negative and away from the positive. So if we had a bunch of sodium outside the cell and the inside of the cell membrane was negative, then that sodium would want to move inward towards the negative region of the membrane and vice versa. If we had, let's say, a negative ion inside the cell and the inside of the cell was negative, which direction would that negative ion, let's say it's a chloride ion, that negative ion would actually electrically want to move outward towards the positive region of the membrane. Now, of course, it's more complicated than that because these ions are not just electrical species. They are also molecules and they're also subject to a concentration gradient. So first, before we get into that, think about electrical gradients. Any molecule that has a charge is going to be paying attention to the overall charge in the region around it. And that's charge created by the sum of all the charged ions around. It doesn't matter the type of ion, the, the identity of those ions. It could be negatively charged proteins or a ton of other different types of ions. Overall, it's just listening to whether it's in a positive or a negative space. And it's going to move or want to move to opposite charged areas. Okay, now for the complicated part. So ions actually have both concentration and electrical gradients that affect them. So there's the concentration of the sodium, but then there's also the charge of the sodium. So we have to consider both when we ask which direction will an ion move across the membrane. So it's not quite so simple as just concentration or just electrical gradients. For ions, we need to consider what we call the electrochemical gradient or the combined electrical and chemical forces. So when electrical and chemical forces are balanced, then there will be no net movement of that particular ion. If they're not balanced, then the ion will move. So you're probably, if you have never seen this before, you're probably thinking, well, how do those forces interact? Which one is going to be stronger? Will the concentration forces or the electrical forces be stronger? Will they always be in the same direction? How do we know? Well, we actually have a way of calculating both the electrical and the chemical forces on the movement of any particular ion. And that method is using the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation looks at the electrical and chemical forces on any given ion and finds the point or the voltage in the membrane at which those are balanced. We will have a separate lecture on membrane potential where we will also apply the Nernst equation to ions like sodium, and potassium and look at their actual concentrations in neurons and see how this applies to nervous system signaling 
I don't want to bog you down with it right now. So put this Nernst equation in your back pocket and know that we're going to be doing a little bit more on this later. Other gradients that are important, pressure gradients. So pressure gradients are important not just for thinking about membrane transport, but also movement of many substances within the cell. So pressure gradients occur when fluid or gases are at different amounts against the surface of a membrane. They're measured in units of pressure, which is millimeters of mercury, and we can think about different types of pressure. For example, fluid pressure is a hydrostatic pressure. We often think about this with respect to blood pressure, and we can see that we need a high to low gradient for pressures, just like we need a high to low gradient for molecules, uh, for concentration gradients. So, for example, blood pressure has to move from high pressure at the heart to lower pressure down at its targets or down at the capillaries. You need those gradients to drive the movement of blood flow. Also, we have gas gradients. So we will talk in the respiratory system about partial pressures of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they also move from high gas pressure to low gas pressure as they're diffusing across different regions of the body. For example, when oxygen diffuses across the capillaries into the target cells to supply them with oxygen. So pressure gradients are also very important for moving substances within the body. Finally, osmotic pressure or osmotic gradients. Osmotic gradients occur due to differences in solute or water concentration in a particular region. So we think about this when the amount of water is different relative to the amount of solute. Remember the solute is whatever molecule is dissolved in that water solution. So if you have a very dilute solution, that means you have very low solute and a lot of water. If you have a very concentrated solution, that means you have a lot of solute and very little water. And as you can see, different concentrations of solutes can drive concentration gradients for those solutes, but they can also drive concentration gradients for water. Water wants to move from areas where there's a lot of water, very low solute, to areas where there's very little water and very high solute, but we never actually measure the water concentration. We only measure the solute concentration. So this is the tricky thing about osmotic gradients. You need to talk about them with reference to the solute concentration, not the water. So that's where it gets a little bit confusing, I think, sometimes for us to think about these gradients. So the easiest way to remember this is that water follows salt or water follows solute. If there's a lot of solute in a particular solution, the water is attracted to it. So the water is going to move to areas of high solute concentration in an attempt to dilute it and make it more balanced. A couple of osmotic terms while we're at it. So osmotic pressure is the pressure exerted by water moving across a barrier. It's measured in units of osmoles where one osmole is one gram of molecular weight of osmotically active solute. In other words, how much solute is present? And osmolarity versus osmolality. I know that I, I have a tendency to use these terms interchangeably and let's not be too picky. Everybody, we don't need to go around and correcting people. No, that's osmolality, not osmolarity. Um, it's, it's really okay. Um, if we, if we say them sort of interchangeably, most of the time we understand what we're talking about. But if you're curious, Osmolarity is based on liter of solution. So it's the number of osmoles or the active, osmotically active solute per liter of solution. And osmolality is the osmoles per kilogram 
of solution. So one is measured per liter and one is measured per kilogram. So often we use osmolality more often because we're going to be measuring body weight versus body liters. Remember that there's osmotic balance, just like the other balanced forces in the body. And this is balancing extracellular and intracellular fluid. So ECF and ICF in the human body are balanced by homeostasis at or near 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. And then we reference solutions with respect to that. So an isotonic solution in the body is going to be equal to about 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. A hypotonic solution is going to be much lower than that or less solute than is present in body cells. That's going to cause the cells to swell because those hypotonic solutions have more water than the solute in the cell. A hypertonic solution is one that has a lot of solute relative to the body cells. That's going to cause the cells to shrink or lose water because they have a lot of solute and they're going to then remove solute from the cells. That water in the cells is going to be drawn out towards that hypertonic solution. So, so far, all of the processes that we have talked about have been passive, meaning that simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis don't require any energy. They simply move in the direction of their gradients. It's also important for us to remember that there are active transport processes, and these are processes that require energy input and are going to be moving molecules against their gradients or in the direction that is opposite to the normal equilibrium forces. So active transport is used to move molecules against a gradient using transport proteins that are coupled to some kind of energy source. Now, if they are directly coupled to ATP, that's a primary active transport. If they're coupled in some other way, that's a secondary active transport. So sometimes they require energy input directly, and often they create the concentration gradients that are used by the passive or secondary transport processes. So let's look at primary active transport first. So primary active transport requires ATP energy directly. The most common example of primary active transport is the sodium potassium pump. This is a pump that moves three sodium for every two potassium. It moves three sodium out of the cell and two potassium into the cell. The importance of this pump is that it actually establishes sodium and potassium gradients that can then be used by other transporters within the cell. So the sodium potassium pump is directly coupled to ATP hydrolysis or splitting those phosphate bonds off of ATP to create the energy to drive the sodium and the potassium against their usual concentration and electrical gradients. There are many other pumps or active transporters. Often we call them pumps because they're pumping things in different directions. There are calcium pumps. There are hydrogen pumps. So many different pumps that are used by cells to move molecules where they want them to go. In some cases, they're moving them to storage sites. So there are many pumps in certain types of cells that are going to be storing calcium for later, later, um, processes. There are calcium pumps that remove calcium from the cell. 
to avoid the calcium signaling events through various uh, commu cell communication events. And hydrogen pumps are, are used in a lot of different ways. One example is hydrogen pumps are used to secrete acid into the stomach. So they pump that hydrogen into the stomach, stomach creating a very acidic environment that both kills bacteria and helps to denature proteins and begin the process of digestion in the stomach. So if we have a cell membrane and we have our sodium potassium pump, you'll see that it's directly coupled to ATP. And that sodium potassium pump is going to pump out three sodium and pump in two potassium to the cell every time it's active. And it also hydrolyzes ATP for that energy source. And what that does is it ultimately builds up a ton of sodium outside the cell and a bunch of potassium inside the cell. And then we can use especially the sodium for later transport processes. So that brings us to secondary active transport. So secondary active transport uses the gradients that are set up by other active transporters. For example, if we use the example of the sodium potassium pump, then we can then use sodium co-transporters that piggyback onto those gradients using sodium as the driving force. So in this example, we said that the sodium potassium pump is responsible for building up a lot of sodium outside the cell. Well, now there's a driving force or a force for sodium to go into the cell because of that concentration gradient that was built up by the primary active transporters. So now other transporters can piggyback onto that sodium gradient and bring sodium into the cell, use the the energy from that sodium gradient now to move something else into the cell that would have otherwise required energy. So for example, there are sodium glucose co-transporters that bring sodium and glucose across the membrane by using those sodium gradients, pumping both sodium and glucose into or out of the cell depending on where they're located. So for a secondary active transport, what I want you to ask is what gradient is being used? And then just remember that that gradient had to be set up by a primary active transport. So ask what gradient, and it's often sodium. The next thing you want to ask for a secondary active transport is what direction, which direction? If it moves in the same direction as the gradient, it's a symporter, meaning it just piggybacks and moves the same way. If it moves in the opposite direction, then it's an antiporter, or sometimes we call them exchangers. So for example, the sodium moves in and the other molecule will move out. For example, we have sodium calcium exchangers that move calcium out and sodium into the cell. Okay. So that concludes the membrane transport lecture. We talked about passive transport processes and the gradients that drive them to move molecules across the membrane without the need for energy. We compared channels and carriers, which are often used to get molecules that can't normally cross the phospholipid bilayer to get those molecules across through these proteins. And finally, we compared passive and active transporters, active transporters being using transport molecules to move substances against their concentration gradients, either directly using ATP or indirectly using energy in the form of gradients. All right, I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions and if you'd like to stick around, I have a challenge question for you to test your knowledge.